so you are trying to get better at something at the moment and whether that's languages or music there's a lot of things that we want to get really really good at but how do you actually achieve world class type mastery well that's what the science of deliberate practice is and that's what this video is going to be talking about and when i was in medical school they showed us this really weird diagram this is called a cortical homunculus in latin homunculus means little man and i'm sure the name of little man got him a lot of ladies hey baby want to go out with me no but if you're really observant, you might notice something a bit weird about this diagram, which is that the hands are the biggest part. They're bigger than the head, they're bigger than the neck, the trunk. Why is it the biggest? It's because this diagram represents a kind of a mind map. The amount of brain devoted to any body part is determined not by the size of the body part, but rather how much information comes to that part from that body part to the brain through the nerves. And this may seem obvious, but the different parts of your brain do different things. For example, even though your eyes are at the front of your face, um, hopefully, <laughs> the part of your brain that processes vision is actually at the back called the occipital lobe. But this concept of different parts of the brain doing different things is actually quite important for you and how you learn skills too. There is something super interesting about learning that I can guarantee you experience in your own life. If you've ever tried to learn a new language when recalling words, it almost feels like your brain is clogged as you're trying to recall them. Tomodachi. But the fascinating thing is that as you do these things again and again, then it becomes easier. And that's this concept of neuroplasticity. And it's happening in your brain as you're watching this video right at the second, so that's kind of meta. <laughs> What's happening at a deeper level is that you have these neurons that are connecting to each other. So the neuron that sends the messages is called the presynaptic neuron, then you have the gap, which is called the synapse, and then you have the other neuron that's receiving the messages called the postsynaptic neuron. But the way that the postsynaptic neuron actually catches these messages is through receptors. So it's kind of like someone with a mitt catching a baseball. The thing is, the more you actually activate these particular neurons, the more receptors are built on the postsynaptic neuron. So in other words, it has more mitts able to catch more baseballs. And so it activates a lot easier, which is why things become easier as you think about them more and more. But something else that's incredible is it's not just about the individual neuron. It's about the way that these neurons adapt as a group. If you look at London taxi drivers, for example, there's a part of all our brains that's responsible for navigation, which is the posterior hippocampi. This part of the brain in taxi drivers is significantly larger than other drivers, even bus drivers, because these London taxi drivers have to navigate through some really complicated roads in London. If you practice something enough, your brain will repurpose neurons to help with the task, even if they already have another job to do. Remember our homunculus? Well, there was a study in the late 1990s where blind people who were expert braille readers just use their index, middle, and ring fingers. Braille is basically that system where you have these physical dots that you can touch and then they represent letters. And so the dots have certain patterns and therefore you can tell which letters are being written physically. The researchers discovered that those parts of the brain grew a heap, but that was a really interesting problem. You see, the braille readers, when they were touching things, they couldn't tell which finger was touching. The parts of the brain related to each finger had grown so big that they started overlapping each other. When one part of the brain was activated, for example, for the index finger, then this is the same part of the brain that was activated for the middle finger. As a result, they couldn't tell which finger was touching. So tying back to the original premise of the video where you want to learn things faster, just repeat it again and again, and then you'll get smarter, right? Is that the concept? No, 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 it's not. You may have heard of the 10,000 hour rule. The 10,000 hour rule is this concept that you need 10,000 hours of work in order to become a world-class expert at something. This was popularized by the author Malcolm Gladwell, who talked about it in his book Outliers. But let me show you what the original researcher, Professor Erickson, who did the study, actually had to say about it. Unfortunately, I think some people have in interpreted the 10,000 hour rule to be something like, if I just spend 10,000 hours doing something, I will magically become an expert. When we study these musicians, uh, we weren't talking about just putting in the hours uh, or, or even basically doing something where you try to improve. We were looking at basically that relationship between a teacher and the student where the teacher can really guide the student to do new things that they have not yet mastered. And in fact, Professor Erickson, uh, may he rest in peace because he actually passed away in 2020. Before he passed away, he wrote this incredible book called Peak, The Science of Deliberate Practice. You see, even if you're working on a skill, not everything that you do is actually gonna help. And it depends on the kind of practice that you're doing. So for example, let's say that you've just learned to start playing tennis. When you start at the very beginning, you just suck <laughs> at tennis. Um, you can't hit the ball, you hit the ball out, you don't know how to do a basic swing. 
But as you play with your friends more and more, you gradually, actually you quite rapidly learn how to do that. And then you get to a level where, hey, maybe you can hit a few balls back. And then if you play for maybe like a month or two, you can actually start to have some rallies. And that's really exciting. But once you reach a certain level where you're able to have your rallies with your friends, you actually stop improving unless you're deliberately trying to push your comfort zone to the next level. It doesn't matter how long you play because if you're fundamentally just doing the same things over and over, then you actually don't improve. And so that's why the 10,000 hour rule is not just about mere practice, but deliberate practice. Learning how to do deliberate practice properly might be one of the most important skills that you ever learn. But before we get into it, if you wanted a summary of the book Peak, there's actually one upon short form. Shortform is this super useful website full of book summaries that I tend to use quite a lot. In fact, although I already bought and read the book Peak, I actually used their summary of the book to help me remind me of stuff that I forgot. Shortform is really good and I really like the way that they summarize things because although it's a summary, it's still quite in depth. And so I don't feel like I'm missing out on the major points of a book when I'm looking at a short form summary of it. The way I use it personally is to kind of discover new books through the platform. So for example, books on my list of things to read include Include productivity books like Getting Things Done, Atomic Habits, and business books like Creativity Inc, which talks about Pixar. They've kindly hit me up with an affiliate link that has a discount on it. So if you use this link, you'll get 20% off the annual membership and also five days of free access, which is nice. The little practice really makes impossible things possible. Here is a complete step-by-step -step process for implementing it. Step one, in the book, Professor Erickson talks about an athlete. His name was Steve. And Steve was made to memorize a huge number of digits. At first, Steve only started being able to memorize about nine digits in a row. So something like 7462863031. But through deliberate practice, the professor trained Steve to memorize to 82 digits. So the step one of deliberate practice is that you always have to be pushing against the comfort zone of your own limits. In Steve's case, baby steps were taken. He started off with memorizing nine digits, then he memorized 10 digits, good idea. He created a specific short-term goal. Memorize more digits than the previous session. And the more specific, the better. Let me demonstrate step two. So here, I'm gonna show you my piano. And the thing is, with deliberate practice, you want to create these specific target exercises for the thing that you're trying to do. So for example, let's say I'm trying to learn a basic blues scale. Well, I'm not very good at this scale to start off with. If I try to do it really fast, it sounds actually pretty uneven. Like My piano teacher once told me that if you practice unevenly, then that helps build up the muscles in your hand so that you can actually practice it more evenly. And you also do the opposite version, which is... Then when you come to do the original version, the even version, it can sound a lot better. There's a study from the book called Make It Stick, where they had these baseball pitchers try either 10 of the same pitch in a row, so for example, fastball, curveball, and split, and compared those to baseball pitchers who were told instead to throw a curveball, then throw a split ball, then throw a fastball, and in a sort of random order. And they found that the second group, the group that actually mixed things up more, were actually much better than the group that had practiced one type of pitch at a time. So that's step two, which is to create specific and targeted exercises for the things that you want to learn, for the very mini skills within the overall skill. When I was a small, curious kid, my mum was really worried that I was going to burn my hand in the oven, but it was obvious to her that I kept wanting to touch it. So what did she do? She said, come here, David. Oh, not like that, but come here, David. Touch this hot oven. And so I touched the oven and then I recalled my hand from this hot oven. I learned my lesson, but Actually, you know, because mom loves me, the, the oven was just lukewarm. She just heated it up a little bit, so it'd be enough for me to feel it, but not actually burn my hand. And that's step three of the practice, which is that immediate feedback is really important. And if that feedback is immediate and direct, you know, like for example, touching an oven is a very direct and immediate consequence, then that's one of the most helpful things that you can have. We have learned a ton today, and there's actually more steps that I want to talk about with deliberate practice that follows on from this video, but I'm gonna split this video into two parts because it's getting quite long. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss that video, and I'll see you next video. Hope you enjoy. It.